We're going to take advantage of the fact that we've used an interface for our storage, which means that we won't need Redis up and running when we're running our unit tests. I'm using Docker PS-A to show all containers, not just the ones that are running. I can see that I've got an exited container here, so I'm going to do a Docker RM against something that's unique enough to identify the container, which in this case is just the number 8 of the first part of the container ID. And that just ensures that I've got a clean system to start out. A couple of videos ago, we looked at ways of unit testing our storage implementation, and that directly tied us to Redis, which also meant we needed a Redis instance running whenever we ran the test suite. Now there's pros and cons to this sort of thing, it's not quite as black and white as it sounds, but ideally I don't want any external services having to run when I run my unit tests. This is not the same as acceptance testing where I would have the actual services up and running, so if my infrastructure relied on RabbitMQ and Redis and maybe some other services, I would actually have those services up and running when doing my acceptance testing. So if you think about the optional video 10 where we covered testing Redis storage as a way to kind of learn about Redis and play with it and get hands on with the library, then once you've done that, do you really need to unit test your implementation of using a third party library? Hopefully that third party library is well tested anyway. And do you really need to test Redis? Well, Redis is battle tested across the globe. So I would say probably not. You don't really need to do that when Redis itself is tested and the library is tested. So what are you gaining by writing those tests? Instead, we're going one level higher here. We're going to mock our storage implementation, which means we can use jests, mocks, to make sure that when we have interacted with our storage interface, things have behaved as we expect. And as long as the implementation, so in this case Redis, correctly implements that interface, then things should behave the same whether we're using Redis or MySQL or some on this storage or whatever. We have some passing tests, so I'm going to narrow this down to just run one test in this case, and that's the should allow adding a game to the list test. The reason for this is I want a working test suite while I start making changes to the test suite. In other words, I don't want to introduce two different types of change at once. What I'm going for here is to set up the mock for our storage implementation. Now, personally, I found mocking with Jest to be really nice once it works, but getting it to work can be a little bit shall we say tricky the first time or a few times that you do it and in truth I still struggle with this and I've been doing it now for like a few years like even this week I've had problems trying to mock out third-party libraries so I always want to say this isn't the easiest thing to get your head around so don't feel bad if you struggle with it. My aim is to show you the kind of the intuitive way to work with Jest and how that sometimes doesn't behave quite as you'd expect. So we start off and we need to import our storage. Now this is in itself a little bit strange in so much as I'm not aware that you can mock an interface directly using Jest. So instead I have to import my implementation of Redis storage, which as we know does implement the interface, which is great, but it feels a little bit strange in that we've had to directly require a specific concrete implementation. If I'm wrong on that, then let me know in the comments. Now, we're told that the module that I've created has no default export, and so I can't actually directly import Redis storage in this way. I'm going to have to import star as storage, which is definitely more common in TypeScript land rather than the destructuring route that you tend to see on regular JavaScript projects. So what this will mean is any calls to storage would need to be storage dot whatever. Once I've done this, I can validate that the test suite is still passing. And this is good as, as I say, it would not be so great if we'd made a separate test and we were trying to test something and also set up stuff because which one broke the system. I can console log out the storage instance here and I can see that it is definitely an instance of Redis storage. In other words, at this stage, it isn't a mock. I can also see that our system's trying to directly connect to Redis, which isn't great. And it's useful to understand why that is. So if we take a look at our Redis implementation, one of the really interesting things about this is that we've defined a couple of constants outside the thing that we're exporting. So we've got Redis at the top there, and we've also got client. And what this is going to try and do is actually spin up our connection to Redis. It doesn't really matter that we're in a test. In some ways, JavaScript is completely unaware and doesn't really care about that. So it's going to try and actually connect to Redis. And this is something that we can't have if we're going to mock this. This is going to have a few implications later, so keep this in mind that it's tried to do this. So the first unintuitive thing, at least in my opinion, that you need to do when you're working with a mock in Jest is you first import it as we have done, and this can be whether it's a first party code or third party code, doesn't really matter. 
you import it in the same way. And then beneath it, you need a second call to mock it. So you provide jest.mock and then the actual full path that you used in your import or you require. And again, this doesn't matter whether you're mocking first or third party code. So whether it's stuff inside your own project or something from node modules. Essentially, if it's from node modules, you would just like jest.mock and then super test without any of the directory stuff in front of it. And if we move the console log now to log out what the storage instance is, two interesting things happen here. The first is that we get a mock instead of the actual implementation. And the second is it still tried to connect to Redis. Now, again, why that is happening is not only really nuanced, but it's really interesting as well, in my opinion, at least. I'm going to change the Redis storage implementation here. And rather than just export a constant, I'm going to export this as a function. And this tells me as a consumer of my own software that I need to invoke this to get access to the stuff that's inside it. And this may also have some implications internally that I don't really need to be aware of from an external perspective. Now, your opinion on this may differ, but use your own judgment and whatever way makes your software comprehensible or easy to understand to you, do, do it your way. Now, this function is still going to return the same stuff, which is an object with those three methods on get, add and remove. And in that capacity, we still implement the interface. Where the more interesting stuff happens here is inside the body of this function. So this is just a standard function. It's just a function that returns an object. In order to stop the creation of a Redis client whenever this module is imported, what we need to do is change the scoping of the way that this variable is defined. And this, again, sounds more complicated than it ought to be, but it is a sort of a, a quirk in a way of JavaScript. This is really all a problem of closure. So what's happening here is one of those things that you may read about. If you've ever read a book like You Don't Know JS, which is a great book, by the way, and you should read it. But if you ever read a book like that, it will often give you examples of problems that occur with JavaScript, especially around closures and stuff. And you're like, uh, I kind of get that. But at the same time, I'd like to see a real world implementation in some actual software and how that applies. And so this is a great example of this. What's happening is we've got our client being created inside the global scope. It's not inside any more specific function, but yet we gain access to that when we call Redis storage. So that's a little bit strange in a way, like you've already invoked the file and then later on at some point in your code, you invoke this function, but it's still got access to that client, even though the client isn't set up inside that function. But that, to me, when you first just use JavaScript, you don't really give that any thought. But the more that you think about JavaScript, the more you may think, well, that's really weird because it's completely impure function in that regard. You call in a function and that's got access to stuff that's defined elsewhere. But like how, like what's going on there? But essentially, because this, this function, Redis storage, is defined as a function under uh, the global scope, and you defined your variable, the, the client inside the global scope. When this function is run, it's got access to everything in global scope because it closes over it. So that's like a great example of closure in the real world and closure that you never really think about as well. And that's why polluting global scope is really weird because this function is going to have access to literally anything defined in global scope, as well as anything that's defined specifically in its own block. Okay, kind of crazy detour there, but why this has implications is because we're always creating that client even though we're running in a test and by moving that client invocation inside the specific body of redis storage what that means is it will only ever be invoked when redis storage is invoked and ultimately because we're then mocking this function it never gets invoked so hooray we kind of solved that problem but you can probably see why when you're first starting out with mocking Stuff like this can be just like, you know, like nights or days and days of work. And you just like, you come away from the computer like, how is this beating me? I hate stuff like this. But yeah, uh, that's the joys of programming, I suppose. So if you don't enjoy that, then uh, maybe time to consider a different career. Maybe we're all sadists. I don't know. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we were splitting this into two different steps. So the first step was to mock out our storage. And the second step will be to actually test our implementation that then uses that mock. So let's move on to that second step at this point. One of the first things that I like to do after introducing a mock, I mean, you've got to think about it that normally when I would be doing this, it wouldn't be split so distinctly into those two steps. But 
in the real world, what I tend to do is once I've set up a mock, I will then console log that mock from inside the actual implementation. And that way I can just validate that I'm definitely working with my mock inside my wider function. And the check I do is no more scientific than validating that the two different instances are a mock. Now that I have my mock, so long as I use it in the way that I would use the real implementation, things should then work regardless once I swap out from using the mock to the implementation in the real system. So here I'm calling storage and then the Redis storage function on that wider storage sort of fake, that mock. And on there, I know that I've got this get function and I can pass in a list name and I should get back everything on that list. After making this change and looking at the outcome of our test, I get two different problems here. And the first one I'm kind of not expecting and the second one would be one that I was expecting. So why on earth am I getting back a content type of text plane? It's a bit strange. But the one that I was expecting was that the get function is not defined. And that's because I haven't fleshed out my mock. So yeah, it's not just going to know about all the different functions that are available. I'm going to have to tell it. Now, I'm not so much worried about that text plane issue at this stage. I think that's because we're just interpreting the error message that we're getting back from calling get on a mock that doesn't know about get. So if that persists after we flesh this out, then I'll worry about that in more detail. In order to provide an implementation for my mock, I'm going to define storage.redisstorage as a jest function. And inside there, I'm going to provide a function that returns this object that contains the various methods. So get, add and remove. Now this is going to cause a problem with TypeScript in that it thinks we're trying to assign to a read only property and that will actually cause the compiling process, the TypeScript compilation process to blow up. So that won't do, but we can get around that by amending package.json to tell TypeScript's jest to ignore the code of 2540. Not something I like to do, but I don't have a better solution to that problem at this point. With that change made, I'm still going to get the red underline error inside WebStorm. I think maybe restarting might solve that. I don't know. It's not that big of a deal for me at this point. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to replace the like sort of stub that we've got with a wider implementation. And this is so that you don't have to watch me type this in, but we're going to cover it in a bit more depth now. I've set my other tests to X it. In other words, I'm skipping them. I'm only focused on this particular test at the moment. So I've defined storage.redis storage inside this particular it block. This means that it wouldn't be available for the other tests, but that's not really an issue at the moment. I'm defining my mock implementation to return an object. Now I could use shorthand syntax here, but I feel that may complicate things a little bit. But essentially what this is doing is going to return something that has the same shape as our interface. TypeScript works with duct typing, so as long as our implementation has exactly the same properties as are expected on the interface, this is all going to work nicely. Add and remove, I'm not too bothered about at this point. I just want to provide essentially a fake implementation, but it's a working implementation. The thing that I am testing in this particular test is the outcome of a get. So I'm defining that as its own separate variable. And the reason I'm doing that is so that I can reference it a little later on as part of an expectation or an assertion inside my test. Again, the get function is just another jest mock. So it's a mock inside a mock in a strange way, but this is going to work just nicely. You can forget about that wider mock calling a mock thing because we're referencing this one directly as its own variable on, uh, on line 23. So don't worry about that. And essentially this is going to return a promise that resolves to be an array containing our game. Now there's different ways to write that as well. This is just one way. For the initial test, I'm going to be really generic and just say that I expect my mock get to have been called. And again, this is how I'd do it in the real world. I'd keep things as simple as possible until they need to be a little bit more complicated. So this would be the first thing that I would check just to make sure that nothing else is causing my test to fail. And we'll come back to this a little later on and make it a little bit more robust. As we've covered already, you can hit P on the keyboard to filter exactly which tests you want to run. And that works by a regex pattern. So I only want to run this specific test and see this particular output. And when I do so, I get a strange output, which, well, it's not that strange if you understand what's happening, but it's initially very strange. We've covered this already. We're getting back an empty object or an empty looking object. The problem is that we're returning a promise from our mock and we're just immediately using that promise as part of our assertion. So we need to await the outcome of that promise before we can start asserting stuff on it. That is, after all, how we've implemented this system so far. So hopefully nothing too strange there. What is a little bit more strange is this initial test failure. 
And it's, I think, not really fair that the outcome here is a nested array inside an array. And it's really not that visually obvious because of the grayed out lines above and below. But hey, again, we programmed the system this way, or at least I did. I can't blame you for this one. But yeah, I, I've i programmed it to work this way. And then I'm making an assertion that it doesn't behave that way. So yeah. Uh, it's kind of interesting that you catch yourself out and this is really cool because you know typically the first time you would spot an error like this is when you bring it into your, your dev environment and you start sending in requests and you're like oh what, what on earth that didn't work quite as well as expected if you're doing it as a test one of the most sort of mind-blowing things about testing when i first started was you can work entirely in code and then the first time you bring it up and it all works and you're like, oh my God, this is magic. How have I done this? Uh, how have I made a system that works first time? It's like, yeah, well, all the effort that you put in in the background is why it works first time. And the nice thing, of course, is if you did accidentally make a mistake, fixing it is is much straight, much more straightforward. Anyway, that's me hyping on about my love of testing. So to round up what I appreciate has been a long video I'm going to bring the other game back into play here and that means that when games for each runs it's going to run through two different tests this is not one test that tests that both games have been added to the list so just just in case that was catching you out we should expect two passes here because it's the same thing twice what this tells us is that our basic mock setup is working and we can iterate on this to improve it which will actually allow us to test the more involved different functions so hopefully you've enjoyed this one and uh, you've gained some new knowledge, hopefully, on different parts of JavaScript. I appreciate I went off on a couple of tangents on this one, but I do think it's all really useful stuff to actually understand why things are happening the way they are, rather than me just showing you ways to fix stuff as the as it blows up.